name is Chris Winslow. I'm the Interim Director for the Ohio Sea Grant College Program and Ohio State University Stone Laboratory. Uh, I want to take this opportunity over the next 15 minutes to talk to you about some of the critical information that, that Ohio Sea Grant and OSU feel needs to be out in, in, into the stakeholders' hands related to harmful algal blooms. Um, so for a quick uh, for reference of where I'm going to go, so I really want to highlight the economic importance of Lake Erie. Um, I want to talk about blooms in the context of climate change. Uh, we need to all know that spring rains are the key to these blooms, um, or one of the key roles or key players in, in how severe these blooms are. I want to make sure individuals understand the difference between TP, which is total phosphorus, and DRP, which is dissolved reactive phosphorus. And I want to show you some trends through time in Lake Erie. I want to talk to you about the difference between phosphorus loading and phosphorus concentrations, and this is a critically important, um, there's a critical important difference between these two things. Um, I, I want to talk about the fact that there are many sources for phosphorus, but we, we do know that ag is, is one of the major players. Um, upwards of 65% of the phosphorus contributed um, in the spring or annually comes from agricultural activities. And then at the end, I want to just kind of wrap up some Board of Regents highlights. So again, the Board of Regents is, is funding $2 million worth of research in, in Lake Erie related to harmful algal blooms, and I wanted to briefly discuss some of those, um, those projects or at least the general context or the general questions that are being addressed. So first off, again, the economic importance of uh, tourism in Lake Erie region. Basically, I, I want to be able to draw your attention to um, the red outlined regions. So those are the eight counties that border Lake Erie. Um, within these eight counties, um, sales is at a level of $2.9 billion. Wages earned related to tourism in these eight counties is at $3.3 billion. Tax revenue, this is uh, federal, state, and local taxes. Um, bring in about $1.7 billion to those eight counties, and uh, about 119,000 individuals are employed by that tourism sector. That, that works out to about one in every 12 individuals within these counties has a job related to um, tourism. And this is just one line of evidence that highlights the economic importance of tourism in the Lake Erie region. Um, and so this is something that we, we as a program, Ohio Sea Grant and OSU Stone Laboratory, um, always highlight um, that this is a critically important region for the state. Of the roughly $40 billion in tourism revenue for the state, as I mentioned, $12.9 billion of that comes from only eight of 88 counties. Um, the next thing I want to transition to, and, and this is basically a land use map of, of the watershed of the Great Lakes, but specifically if you look at Lake Erie, it's surrounded by a lot of reds, yellows, and oranges. And if you look at the key, the driving point I want to make with this slide is that we are surrounded by a lot of urban areas, so people. Um, also different degrees of farming or farming and pasture use. So those are the orange and yellow colors. If you actually break this down into a graph which has percent of land coverage on the vertical axis or the y-axis, the lakes are along the x-axis, you'll see in the orange color that we're first in residential um, land use. So we have the most people in our watershed relative to the other four Great Lakes. We're first in crop land relative to the other four Great Lakes. We're only second in pasture, falling behind Ontario. We have the least amount of forested area, which is the yellow shaded region relative to the other four Great Lakes. And I have the number 10% within the red bar. That bar re represents wetlands. Um, as you can see, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron both have more wetlands than Lake Erie has. But I put 10% there to remind individuals that we only have about 10% of historic wetlands that exist. So about 90% have been converted to some other land use. Um, and this really graph, and, and I know that individuals that, that will access this, this webinar or this PowerPoint have probably heard this information before, but I want to make sure it's out there because what it can allow us to say is that Lake Erie gets more sediment and nutrients than all the other Great Lakes. And when I say nutrients, I'm referring to commercial fertilizers and manure because of the heavy agricultural use in its watershed, but also sewage because of um, the heavy population within the watershed. And I also want to move into my second point that I put on the outline slide, which is the fact that these harmful algal blooms are exacerbated and these nutrient loads are exacerbated by storms. And what we are seeing is more frequent storming events, but also more severe storm events. So events that are larger in size, so as far as the volume of water dropped during these events. I also want to remind individuals that are looking at this PowerPoint or, or, or listening to this webinar that, that um, Lake Erie is the shallowest of the five Great Lakes. And so these inputs into this, this water body um, 
are going to elevate concentrations in a, in a pretty small water body relative to the other Great Lakes. Um, but as a result, with the graph I showed you previously showing, again, land use, and I'll, I'll give you a glimpse back at that graph, um, we can clearly sh show that Lake Erie is going to be the most productive of the Great Lakes. And oftentimes this program um, has emphasized what we call the 50 to 2 rule. So Lake Superior has about 50% of the Great Lakes water, Lake Erie has about 2%, but Lake Erie has about 50% of the biomass of fish relative to Lake Superior, which has only about 2% of the biomass. So this is a very, very, very productive system. That in itself is not a bad thing. This is why we're the walleye capital of the world, because we have a lot of, um, we have nutrient inputs that give us algal growth, and that algal growth is the base of the food web that supports a lot of life. But in any talk I give related to Lake Erie and nutrient loading and harmful algal blooms is that we can always have too much of a good thing. Some nutrients are good. Having a productive lake is a good thing. But when we push that too far and throw the ecological balance off, that's the concern we have. So the next point I wanted to move into was this taking HABs and nutrient loading in the context of climate change. We need to know, and this is a busy slide and, and, and I don't have the ability to animate some of this, but what I really want to show that we're seeing an increase in, again, the volume of um, water that's dropped in these rain events, but also the frequency of these rain events. So if you look at the uh, first sub-bullet, the number of storm runoff events per year is up about 67% from the time period of 1960 to 2010. Um, more importantly, I would argue, is that the second sub-bullet says the number of spring runoff events is up 40%. This is critically important because it's that spring period that is going to be responsible for delivering the nutrients that ultimately drive these blooms. The last one I want to show you also is that the annual storm discharge, the fourth sub-bullet, is up 53%. Again, highlighting this data coming from Heidelberg and Dr. Pete Richards, highlighting that these storm events are not only more frequent, but they're larger in, in size. Okay. The other seasonal comparisons that were done that aren't on this slide also are showing in increases, but not significant increases. So what this illustrates to us, the punchline you should take from this slide right here, is that 89, 80 to 90% of the loading happens 10 to 20% of the time. So these heavy storm events, these 10 to 20% of the storm events that happen are carrying the vast majority of nutrient loading, and that's primarily phosphorus into the lake. Um, this graph also shows that same thing, and I want to walk you through each of these panels. Starting on the left, this one on the y-axis shows spring discharge. This is for the Maumee River, and on the bottom axis is date through time. And what you'll see is the gray represents the range from 2011 through 2015, um, and then each individual line color represents a different year. And what you'll see is the black line represents the mean. And what it's showing you is the mean discharge across all these years. On the panel to the right, you're seeing DRP, and remember that, res that stands for dissolved reactive phosphorus. Same kind of scenario with what you're looking at, gray is the range, the different lines represent the different years. What I want to highlight is when you look at a, a vertical increase, like let's follow the green line for 2011 in the panel on the left, when you see that increased discharge, that heavy storm that happens in that early March period, you will also see a corresponding phosphorus load. And then you'll see in flat line areas where there is low discharge, you'll see low phosphorus inputs. So what I really want you to recognize in the take home message from this slide, and again in the context of climate change, is that when you get these storm events, those discharge events are correlated with these high dissolved reactive phosphorus concentrations. Okay? I'm just showing you a, a figure of some of these blooms in the basin. So this is a photo from September 24th of 2013, showing you the green bloom there in the western basin. Um, the next slide is giving you a look into the severity of these blooms over the last uh, 13 years, from 2002 to 2014. Warm colors, meaning the orange and the reds, are high concentrations of blooms, where the cool colors, the purples and the blues, are lower concentrations. Black means no bloom present. I show you this across the year because you'll see that from 2008 to 2014, we're seeing quite a bloom footprint in the western basin and in some cases in the, in the central basin of Lake Erie. Moving more closely, I want to take a close-up view of 2008, um, which was a heavy um, precipitation year, and I want to sh compare that to 2011, which was one of our worst blooms on record, and 2012, which was one of our um, smaller blooms on record. And so what you're seeing on this slide is, is those images pulled out, 2008 on the top, 2011 the worst bloom on record in the middle, and 2012 a, a, what we would call a, a, a moderate um, or minimal bloom. 
And what I want to do, and again, this is a busy slide, what I want you to be able to recognize is um, how this is driven by spring rains. So if you look at 2008, the peculiar thing about 2008 is this was a very wet year. If you look at discharge, so the amount of water coming through this system, we had 8 billion cubic meters in this year. So that's high relative to 11, worst bloom on record, and 12, um, you know, a, a weak bloom, where those only had about 6.2 billion or 6.1 billion cubic meters of annual discharge. What you'll see is the big difference across these for one that had a heavy bloom in 2011 versus a moderate bloom in 2012 is that spring discharge. So you'll see in 2008, the spring discharge was 3.4 billion cubic meters, where in 2011, it was 5 billion cubic meters. So of that 6.2 billion that fell into the lake during 2011, the bulk of it, the lion's share, came in the spring. Versus 2012, which again had a comparable annual discharge, 6.1 to 6.2 to the 2011 year, but look at the spring discharge, only 1 billion cubic meters in the spring. And so what that does is it changes the loading happening in that spring period. So you'll see in 2008, our reference year, you know, we had about 3.4 billion of spring discharge and the spring load of phosphorus was 1,400 metric tons. And you can see the resulting bloom. But look in 2011, the worst bloom on record, when you have that 5 billion cubic meters of spring discharge, the spring load is 2,300 tons. So that's where that bloom is being driven from. And Opposition to that, or in contrast to that, in 2012, if you look at the spring load, again, the discharge was 1 billion cubic meters, but the spring load was only 400 tons. Not enough phosphorus in that spring period to tie into a bloom. So two things we can wrap together here. One is that if you get heavy rain events and more frequent rain events, you're going to load those nutrients. But the timing of that nutrient input, the spring, is critically important. In 2011, we had a heavy spring discharge and a heavy spring load resulting in a heavy bloom. In 2012, we had a low spring discharge and a low spring load of phosphorus, and there was a minimal um, bloom. I want to definitely talk about the difference between TP, which is total phosphorus, and DRP, which is dissolved reactive phosphorus. Total phosphorus is a measure of all, as the name or, or suggests, all the phosphorus in the water. And what you'll see is that only about 25 to 50 percent of that phosphorus is actually readable, readily available to those blooms. If you look at the graph I've given you, we're measuring total phosphorus on the vertical axis and time on the, um, on the x-axis. Um, what you'll see, the line that breaks through this graph, shows that there is an increase, but it's only about a 13% 13 13 increase in total phosphorus from 1990 to roughly present day. Okay? But if you take this and compare it to DRP, which is the phosphorus that's more readily available to blooms, we're seeing a 144% increase. So we're seeing this from 1990 to 2012, a dramatic increase in the amount of DRP. Again, phosphorus that's readily available to blooms and the, and the cyanobacteria. Um, what this uh, has shown us is that what we're really working on now is, is, is how do we address this DRP? And we've shown from multiple studies that most of this DRP, or a lot, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of this DRP is coming from um, drain tiles coming off of agricultural fields. We've seen studies that show anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the phosphorus entering um, those, those rivers is coming from directly from drainage tiles. So there is a difference. Total phosphorus is all the phosphorus in the, in the system. DRP is that that's available, readily available for um, the cyanobacteria or harmful algal blooms, and that has shown a dramatic 140 percent, 144 percent increase since 1990. This slide I'm using to talk to you about the difference, and this is key, the difference between phosphorus loading, okay, the amount of total phosphorus entering the system, total phosphorus we're talking, versus um, concentration. Okay? Total phosphorus load is important, and that's what all the models use to predict these blooms. But what you're seeing on this graph, and this data is from 2008, it's one of the years that we have the most comprehensive data available, you're seeing a dot or a bar on all the major tributaries of the Great Lakes. Dots mean they're tributaries that are less than 100 metric tons annually, and bars are those that are above 100 metric tons annually. And the value is a place next to those dots and the bars. What you'll see is the Maumee River down here above the box that says 801010, and this year has 3,800 and change metric tons of phosphorus added to the western basin of Lake Erie. <coughs> Excuse me. Oftentimes, individuals talk about how Detroit River is playing, or they suggest that the Detroit River is playing a role in these blooms or causing these blooms. Well, you can see that Detroit is providing a lot of total phosphorus. In this case, in 2008, 2040, 
metric tons annually of total phosphorus. The difference I want to drive home here, again, the difference between loading and concentration draws us to that yellow box in the bottom, 80-10-10. Again, this is a rule that Ohio Sea Grant and OSU Stone Laboratory mention all the time. What this shows you is where the water in the Lake Erie comes from. 80% of it comes from the Detroit River, 10% from um, all the tribs outside the Detroit River, and 10% from precipitation directly on the lake. So what this is telling you is that 2,000 metric tons, approximately 2,000 metric tons that are coming from the Detroit River are coming from the same place that the bulk of the water is coming from, where the Maumee River bringing 3,800 metric tons is coming at a much smaller volume of water. And therefore, the concentration is that in which we can drive a balloon. The concentration coming out of the Detroit, although it's a high, again, total phosphorus load, is diluted to the, to the port portion where it can add to the bloom severity, but it's not driving the onset of that bloom. Same thing is being shown from this. Again, a very busy graph. Wasn't able to use animations in this, but basically on the top four panels, you're seeing 2008 total phosphorus, 2011, 12, and 13 total phosphorus. It's broken down into red is the Detroit River contribution, blue is the Maumee River concentration, and then, uh, or I'm sorry, contribution, and green is all the other trips outside the Detroit and Maumee. What you'll see is that depending on the year, you know, it hovers between about, you know, 45% or 30, high 30% of contribution from Detroit versus the Maumee River. But again, and then we can pull that down to the bottom left-hand corner, that's a, an average across 2011, 2012, 2013. So the bottom left-hand corner, that's the average of total phosphorus contributed from the Detroit, the Maumee, and other tribs across 11, 12, and 13, you can see that it's about equal in the contribution of total phosphorus. However, if you look at the panel to the right, which shows flows through those rivers, you can see that 95% of the, of the flow across those three years, 11, 12, and 13, came from the Detroit River, where only 4% came from the Maumee. And so what that tells you is that if you take the total phosphorus and do an average flow-weighted total phosphorus concentration, which is the bar graph to the right, the Maumee River um, is a tremendous input, as are the other rivers outside the Detroit River, uh, bringing total phosphorus into the system. So again, we've got to distinguish between loading of total phosphorus versus concentrations. Okay? Yes, Detroit has a lot of phosphorus loading, as does the Maumee, but the flow coming out of the Detroit makes the concentrations in that river um, Tudo to be driving the blooms. Again, they can, that phosphorus can contribute to the severity of that bloom, but they're not driving the onset and, and ultimately the scope of those blooms. Last thing I want to do to wrap out the 15 minutes that I had allocated to me was talk about some actions that we can take. Um, and again, these have been disseminated uh, by Ohio Sea Grant and OSU Stone Lab um, and OSU as a whole and many other institutions. Um, but I definitely wanted to highlight these possible action areas. Um, this whole slide you're looking at right now is agricultural actions. Again, I want to highlight that, again, the lion's share of, of, of that phosphorus being contributed to the system, you know, anywhere from 65 to, you know, 80 percent, depending on how wet that spring is, is coming from agricultural practices. Um, this is not, the intent of this is not to say that, you know, it's all ag's fault and we're blaming agriculture for this. We're just identifying the sources and now we need to work as a, as a, as a, <coughs> Community, community of scientists and stakeholders to address the problem together. Um, so really concentrate on the red bolded areas. So the first thing we can do is, is eliminate the application of uh, fall and winter application of fertilizer, commercial fertilizers and manures. We'd like to eliminate broadcast application and do some incorporation of these different types of fertilizer into the soil. We'd like to get a more um, exhaustive and um, efficient soil testing in place. We are seeing that a lot of Ohio fields, in, th in this case of roughly 30%, already have too, too much phosphorus present and don't need the addition of extra fertilizers or manure. We uh, ask for, uh, to continue no fertilizer application when the rain is forecasted within 48 hours. We'd like to at least place a moratorium on addition of tiles. We really need to get a handle on this contribution of dissolved reactive phosphorus coming from these drain tiles. Again, anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the DRP dissolved reactive phosphorus is coming from these sources. And the last one is, is maybe consider reducing the size of farms falling under CAFO. CAFO are concentrated animal feeding operations. And basically the idea is can we basic work on controlling um, manure inputs into the system 
by looking at uh, the management of, those, uh, of manure on these different size farms. Other levers we can pull outside of the agricultural realm, uh, lawn care, so the application of fertilizer on our urban lawn landscapes. So again, if we can be applying zero phosphorus fertilizers would be one way we can address the phosphorus input. Trying to reduce property runoff, whether this is through rain barrels or porous surfaces or rain gardens. Sewage treatment plant recommendations, not only eliminate combined sewer overflows or CSOs, but also try and reduce the volume that's sent to the treatment plants. Um, this whole issue, harmful algal blooms, nutrient loading, we, also, we often hear it talked about as a nutrient problem. That is true. Phosphorus is driving these. We also need to think of this in terms of a water management issue also. So how do we maintain those more frequent and more severe storms on the landscape? Um, water treatment plant operations, so not sewage treatment, but water treatment. We do have a, a, a history of adding orthophosphate phosphate to treated water because it slows corrosion. Um, possibly addressing that input of phosphorus. And then also there are septic tanks along um, Lake Erie and also inland. This harmful algal bloom issue isn't just a Lake Erie issue, but we can be more closely monitoring septic tanks. The last thing I want to do um, before I run o over on time is, is to highlight the five focus areas of the $2 million that, were provided, uh, that was provided by the Board of Regents to researchers throughout the state. Yes, Ohio Sea Grant and OSU Stone Lab is, is managing these projects and, and making sure the, the projects are being completed as outlined and, and the budgets are being spent properly. But this research is happening across eight um, universities, um, across um, 18 different projects. Um, focus areas here are basically HABs detection and water quality. So we're looking with these projects to look at how we detect, map, and warn individuals of, of the presence of HABs. One is to produce safe drinking water. We know correcting and lowering the phosphorus input of the lake is not going to happen overnight. And this is a, you know, a goal that we have to stri uh, strive for over the next you know, five to 10 years. But what we can do right now is arm those, those water treatment plants with tools, technologies, and training to get the toxins out of the water. Uh, we need to work on land practices, so edge of field monitoring and implementing BMPs throughout the Maumee River watershed and throughout the entire watershed, I would argue. Um, human health and toxicity. Again, even though the blooms might be here for a while until we get a hold on um, land use practices and, and, and sources of phosphorus, we need to worry about the health effects right now. So we're studying um, the presence of toxins in fish tissue and the impact of these toxins, for example, on, on liver. And the last thing is to look at the economic and policy levers we can pull to help it, um, get us to a place where we can reduce these phosphorus loads um, by 40% you know, over the next um, few years. And with that, I'm actually going to uh, just show the fact, again, that this is not just a Lake Erie problem. These are some images of other lakes throughout the region. And just want to highlight the, the, the fact that um, this is an issue that we need to address and that we need to be working on. Um, any questions that you might have based on this, uh, this presentation or this PowerPoint, feel free to contact Dr. Chris Winslow at, a, at Ohio Sea Grant, um, and I can address any questions you might have. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for listening today. My name is Jay Martin. I'm a professor of ecological engineering at Ohio State University. I also serve as the lead faculty for the Field of Fawcett program at Ohio State. And today I'd like to introduce the Field of Fawcett program and talk about end-to-end -end solutions for Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, I think this slide is really important. We've all heard a lot about the um, toxic algae that happened in Lake Erie in August of 2014 and how it shut down the drinking water for the citizens of Toledo for three to four days in August of 2014. This is a really important event because it brought the harmful algal blooms uh, to national prominence. It affected state legislation. It really took this from, a, from an issue that affected beachgoers and fishermen to something that really affected everyone. Um, it led to a lot of important things, and it actually led to the founding of the Field of FOSSA program that I'm speaking of today. So with that in mind, I think it's important to note that Toledo is not the only municipality to suffer from drinking water bans. Uh, also in 2014, Monroe, Michigan, and Pele Island in Canada suffered from drinking water bans, and going back to 2013, Carroll Township suffered from drinking water bans. So, so while we try to address the, the harmful algal bloom problem by looking at uh, land management issues and what's happening on the field, it's very important for us to realize that it's going to take us five to ten years to make those changes. And while, that, while those five to ten years pass by, we need to maintain safe drinking water uh, for the citizens that live along Lake Erie. So that's the reason we need to look at end-to-end -end solutions from the field to the faucet. 
Another important impact that I'd like to highlight here is something in the middle between the field and the faucet, and this is, this is, these are impacts on the aquatic ecosystem. And a lot of this work is being done by Stu Ludson and others at the Aquatic Ecology Laboratory at Ohio State. And so one of the things that we're noticing is changes in the, in the, in the food structure and the food web um, that supports Lake Erie. So as there's more cyanobacteria, and cyanobacteria are the, are the organisms that cause the harmful algal blooms, as we see more cyanobacteria, we see less of the beneficial algae that, that the fish can eat. And so as we see less of this beneficial algae that supports the food web that leads to smaller fish, that bigger fish such as walleye um, and yellow perch eat, we're seeing changes. So we don't, we don't know right now if these changes are impacting the walleye and yellow perch, but we do know that there is a change if there's more cyanobacteria and less beneficial bacteria, or less beneficial algae, excuse me. The other change that we're seeing is we are picking up traces, minute concentrations of of uh, microcystin in game fish in Lake Erie. So we have measured concentrations of microcystin in walleye and yellow perch. I do, wanna, I do wanna emphasize that these fish are still safe to eat. These are very low concentrations, so it is safe for the, pub, for the public to eat these fish, but we are picking up concentrations of microcystin in the game fish. We're not quite sure how it's getting there, uh, if, it's, if it's due to a seasonal exposure, if it's due to a lifetime exposure, but we are seeing some impacts on the aquatic ecosystem. So this slide, I, I just want to make the point that this isn't just an, just an issue for Lake Erie. This is something that's impacting water bodies across the state of Ohio. So uh, this, is a, this is an image from 2013. You can see in that year there were water advisory postings for 22 water bodies across the state of Ohio. Um, but in 2015, where we are now, I'm sure I could make a similar math. There's already um, been warnings issued for many inland water bodies across the state of Ohio, Buckeye Lake, Grand Lake St. Mary's, um, lakes in southwestern Ohio as well. So field the fossils, it, while the focus is on, great, is on uh, great Lakes, especially Lake Erie, we're also looking across the state at inland water bodies as well. So with that being said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the field of faucet approach and what are some of our goals. As I mentioned, end-to-end -end, end -to -end solutions are very important for us. So in the fields, we want to maintain a sustainable food supply that can result in economic benefits to farmers. That's very important for the state of Ohio and our um, economic livelihood here. At the same time, we need to maintain safe drinking water for our citizens. So looking at the end-to-end -end solution and looking in between there at the aquatic ecosystem looking from the field to the faucet. We want to accelerate applications. So soon I'm going to talk about research that's being funded from field to faucet. So it's very important to take that research, accelerate the movement of that research from the laboratory, from edge of field sampling, and get that to applications on the field where we can limit the amount of phosphorus getting into Lake Erie. Um, we'd also, it's, very also, it's also very important to collaborate with other agencies and universities and that will allow us to more quickly identify and address knowledge gaps. It's also important to realize that we're not reinventing the wheel here. On the right-hand side of this slide, I have a list of um, topics that we have a lot of past and ongoing expertise with within the state of Ohio and within the Midwest that we can pull from as we make these contributions to improve water quality um, across the state and in Lake Erie. Uh, a very brief timeline of the Field of Fossil program. It was launched in the fall of 2014 with a million dollars in support that was provided by the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. Um, the program was launched by Dean Bruce McFerrin of the College of Food, Agri Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. Um, in November 2014, Ohio State and University of Toledo were selected to manage $2 million, which was provided by the Ohio Board of Regents. These projects have begun. Uh, sea Grant, as, as you can see here, is playing a pivotal role in this. They're actually leading the management of these, uh, these, diff these 18 projects, actually. And in March of this year, five research projects were launched that were supported by the million dollars that, were, that was invested from the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences that I'd like to describe now. So as you see here, this, this diagram is very good. It shows that our, that our focus is looking from the field to the faucet. 
So the first two of the five projects I'd like to talk about are highlighted with circles here. And these involve the management of data and information. So the first one in the middle is a data co-op. We have a lot of great information about water quality, water flow, and farming practices across the Western Lake Erie Basin. What we don't have is a central way to organize that information. This data co-op would, would provide that central uh, way to organize that information so researchers such as myself and others would have an easy place to pull that information from. We'd also like to get that information in the hands of farmers. So this is where the other circle comes into play, the field management applications. With this, farmers will be able to see how, what, how their different practices can impact water quality. They can also see how different practices will impact agronomic yields and how their neighboring farmers are using different practices to improve water quality or improve agronomic yields so that farmers can benefit from this data sharing as well. Another thing we're trying to do with field management applications is get farmers' information about impending storms in their hands, in the cabs of tractors, so that they can realize when and when not to apply fertilizers in a very quick and efficient way. Um, moving on, there's two other important projects, um, microcystin detection and bloom detection. These are both focused on maintaining safe drinking water. While we're trying to address the issues on the fields, that's going to take five or ten years probably to reduce the amount of phosphorus getting into Lake Erie. As I said before, it's going to be vitally important to maintain safe drinking water this time. One of the limitations right now is the ability to know the concentration of microcystin in real time. Right now, uh, drinking water treatment plants take a sample of water, they send it to be analyzed, and 12 to 24 hours later they get the results from that. They, they find out how much microcystin is in that water and then they try to treat the water flowing through their plant based on information that's 12 to 24 hours old. So if we can develop real-time microcystin detectors, this would be great. This would be a great help to wastewater to drinking water treatment plants as they determine how to best treat the water. One of these is a microcystin detector that would actually go in the water and, and tell you how much microcystin is in the water. The other one is using UAVs to detect uh, blooms and determine how much microcystin is in the water. The last project um, that we funded I'd like to talk about is manure recycling. So here the idea is to remove some of the nutrients from manure before we put it on the field so that we can strip some of the nitrogen and phosphorus from that manure so it can be put onto the field without as much of a risk of nitrogen or phosphorus running off. Um, this is something that's probably more important for areas such as Grand Lake St. Mary's and inland lakes. Um, Grand Lake St. Mary's, some of our, or for Lake Erie, some of our research shows us that just about 10% of the farmers actually apply manure to their crops. Most of it's synthetic fertilizer application for the western Lake Erie Basin. But inland lakes such as Grand Lake St. Mary's, there's an abundance of livestock, there's an abundance of manure, a lot, a lot more farmers apply manure to their fields in these settings. So in these areas, it will be great if we can develop ways to strip out some of that phosphorus and nitrogen before the manure is applied to the field and limit the amount of nutrients that can run off the field. So those are the five projects that we funded initially from Field to Faucet, and they actually began, <clears throat> they actually began excuse me, in March 2015. Um, other current actions that we're pursuing in the Field to Faucet program right now there's a regional conservation uh, partnership program, part of a USDA award. And here we partnered with um, Michigan and Indiana to uh, earn an award of $17.5 million. It's going to be available for cost shares. This will allow farmers to implement different BMPs, such as drainage water management, things, um, things that they can use cost shares for. And I just want to note that the enrollment period is open now through July 17th for farmers to enroll in this program. Uh, we're also developing a weather risk management tour, tool. This will warn farmers of impending storms. Um, this is a partnership between NOAA, Ohio Department of Agriculture, and Ohio State University. And lastly, we're pursuing the development of a best management handbook. So there's a lot of different there's a lot of different best management practices out there, and it's a little bit confusing. It can be confusing for farmers to know which one of these best management practices might be the best for their farm. So the idea of this tool is, is for farmers to be able to input information about their farm, such as their slope of their field, their soil type, the type of crop that they're farming, the crop rotations they're using, and based on that to recommend what 
BMP would, would be best for them in terms of water quality improvement, also in terms of economic impact on their farming operations. So these are some of the other current actions that we're pursuing right now with the Field of Fossil Program. We have a lot of great partners for the Field of Fossil Program, which are, which are really important to us, uh, include government agencies and also academic institutions. Um, and lastly, I'm going to close by talking about some of the next steps for the Field of Fossil Program. So we definitely want to manage our current Field of Fossil and Ohio Border Region projects for applications that I mentioned before. While this research is very important, the next step is even more important to take the research to applications to change what's happening on the fields and to maintain a safe drinking water supply. Continue to integrate research and extension at OSU with that of other organizations to accelerate improvements. Work to generate funding to support future Field of Fossil projects. So we don't just want to have these five projects. We want to have many more projects in the future, and we've already had some awards from some uh, commercial seed operations to further our, our projects in Field of Fossil. We also want to develop a youth education, education component. Looking back at the history of Lake Erie, Lake Erie's uh, had problems since the 70s. It's been bad. It's been good. It's bad again. It's very important to get the youth involved in this, looking forward to the future so that we can maintain um, safe, swimmable Lake Erie and a productive food supply well into the future. And lastly, it's important to note that Ohio is not the only one experiencing harmful algal blooms. This is a problem that's, that's impacting um, lakes and coastal areas across the globe. So as we develop new knowledge from Ohio, it's important for us to apply that knowledge to algal blooms across the globe just as it's important for us to learn from uh, other research and other applications being done to address these problems at other areas. So with that, I'll uh, thank you for your time today. Um, I will welcome you to contact me if you have any questions about this presentation. Um, contact me via email is probably the best way, martin.1130 at osu.edu. And I thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Labarge. I'm a field specialist in agronomic systems with Ohio State University Extension. I've been in this role for about three years and have been providing some leadership to extension programs going on across the state in relationship to nutrient management education. I, I uh, have a history of being a field uh, or actually a, a county a base person as an extension educator in ag and natural resources. So a lot of what I develop and have done over my history working with OSU has been related working related to working directly with farmers. And some of the information that I want to represent here actually uh, is a combination of what is being developed at the state level and then what is being transferred down to our local educators. So our local county-based staff, uh, both extension educators and other program staff in the Ag and Natural Resources program have been really essential in delivering this program and working with farmers in relationship to a better understanding of nutrient management, both from a crop production standpoint as well as a water quality standpoint. So I, I want to just share with you kind of a summary and pieces and parts of this has probably been known to you uh, as you uh, work with uh, different uh, different uh, programs and different uh, news uh, releases out there, but uh, try and put it into one place as far as the educational programs that Ohio State University Extension has been working on with farmers. Uh, two, first uh, is implementing two of the legislative actions that have happened, uh, one of those being the uh, FACT training for fertilizer applicators here in the state. Um, then also uh, Senate Bill 1, uh, and that re revolves around some application criteria and uh, really ties into a couple things that Chris was mentioning as far as agricultural actions. Uh, you can see that both of these programs are fairly new. The fertilizer certification began in August of 2014, so not quite a year old yet. Uh, Senate Bill 1 became effective as of 7-3-2015, uh, so just a couple of days ago. Um, we do a lot of activities and extension in the field, and I want to share with you a few of the things that are going on, um, things that really tie into some on-farm research uh, projects, uh, talk about some new projects that we're gearing up for, and then kind of a final summary of why field res results are very important as we look at this issue. Um, just 
first of all, a summary about our FACT training. Um, it is a program that was uh, uh, legislatively enacted with the Ohio Department of Agriculture as the issuing authority for those certifications. Uh, we as Ohio State University Extension provide the required educational sessions for that certification program. Um, right now, uh, as of uh, this spring, when we finished up our training, we had about 6,500 persons who have gone through those sessions in uh, we had held 110 different sessions at county locations throughout the state of Ohio. Uh, you see there a uh, scene from one of the training sessions, and as far as uh, upcoming trainings, uh, they are posted at the website that you see uh, listed there. Um, this graphic gives you an ideal of where those uh, folks um, statewide have been trained at, and you can see with the darker brown, uh, the concentration of folks that have attended the certification trainings up in the northwest region of the state, uh, the area that we're most concerned about in relationship to uh, what goes on in Lake Erie. Um, just to give you an idea of what goes on in the training, uh, what we do talk about are these four or five topic areas. Uh, for, first of all, just making sure they understand the rules for the certification. Uh, then we do focus in on some of the nutrient enrichment effects on water quality, talking about nitrogen and phosphorus and their effects on water quality from both a harmful algal bloom as well as a hypoxia standpoint. Um, soil testing is very important, particularly for the phosphorus component of what we do for nutrients, and uh, want to make sure that we're doing that soil testing in the correct manner, and then also interpreting the results of those uh, as we relate to phosphorus management. Uh, then we are also talking about nitrogen, which has a component in the freshwater system for harmful algal blooms, but certainly is important when we talk about hypoxia issues in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the training material that were used last year are available at the website that you see right there, and uh, you're welcome to go to those. And, and we do have this manual that you see listed here, which uh, has been a good resource for folks to take home from the training and use it for applications uh, back when they get to the farm. Uh, this kind of gives you a brief, as we've done some survey um, or ga gathered some survey results from participants in the program. Uh, tells us a little bit about what and who has attended and how they feel about things. Uh, first of all, uh, when we talk about uh, these programs, we do have about 20% of the participants who have not attended past OSU Extension programs, so we're reaching some new audiences and helping them with some information that we think will be useful to them. I, I think it's important with the first question there that people do, as far as farmers do, recognize that phosphorus is a significant water quality problem and they are interested in looking at results and, and trying to do a better job of managing managing both for their farm operation from an economic standpoint as well as the water quality component. Um, the workshops, uh, they do walk away feeling like they've gained some more knowledge that they can apply back to their farm um, is answered as a question in the, the next couple of statements there that we see. Um, so that kind of summarizes the FAC training and where we're at with that. A very successful start to that program, and uh, we have reached, uh, once again, 6,500 people uh, basically with the information and looking at better application techniques and a better understanding of nutrients, uh, both uh, for yield and, and economics as well as water quality, so we can tie that together and see changes in practices um, in the field. Um, just a reminder that Senate Bill 1 uh, was uh, passed earlier this year, came to effect uh, in full effect on uh, July 3rd, just a couple of days ago. And what it is is a criteria for manure and granular fertilizer with phosphorus and nitrogen component to it, um, application um, criteria. Uh, basically, no frozen snow covered applications uh, with both of those products. Uh, when the top two inches of soil are saturated, uh, no application at that point. And then also starting to take into account a weather forecasting criteria, either a 24 hour when we're talking about manure or a 12-hour 
weather forecast and uh, based off of whether there is an inch or half an inch, depending on which product we're using, uh, making no applications. So uh, we're starting to get information out uh, related to that. And um, in yellow in the graphic here are the highlighted uh, counties that are named in the legislation that these rules apply to. And you can see uh, basically that encompasses the, the Western Lake Erie Basin, uh, Portage River, as well as the Sandusky River watersheds in Northwest Ohio. Um, switch to a, a bit of our other activities that we have going on, and we do have a number of activities uh, looking at uh, different aspects of uh, nutrient application and source uh, or working with different sources of nutrients. Uh, first of all, we are looking at validating the Ohio nutrient recommendations as they currently stand. Uh, we're working with some alternative manure application timing that I think uh, puts the nutrient in the right place at the right time. Uh, following through with the edge of water quality or edge of field water quality monitoring and then uh, validation of our P index tool that helps us better target practices such as BMPs to areas where we're going to get the most effect in improving water quality. Uh, talk a little bit about the validation of the Ohio nutrient recommendations. Our goal here is to really take a look at N, P, and K, our three major nutrients that we need for crop production. We're using both small uh, plot as well as on-farm plots to validate those recommendations. Uh, we want to make sure that they're correct and that they address the uh, uh, yield needs out there as well as making sure that we limit the excess nutrients that are left that become exposed to loss. Uh, uh, Dr. Steve Coleman in the School of Natural Resources is our lead on that project, uh, began in 2014 and uh, an ending date of 2018 for that project. And so uh, we're looking at revising our recommendations and then providing guidelines for adaptive management um, moving forward with the application of that material. Um, another program that uh, we've got a lot of field research that has been happening on, and that is looking at alternative manure application timing. Um, really what we're trying to do with this is take liquid manures and um, make applications right prior to when the crop is going to utilize that nutrient. And in that, we're also balancing out because we're trying to provide nitrogen for the um, either a wheat or corn crop, which are grass crops that require nitrogen, um, what we're trying to do and, and end up having happen in that uh, uh, supplying nitrogen for those uh, grass crops is a balancing of the phosphorus need for a two-year um, crop rotation. So we're um, working to replace the nitrogen that's added. Um, and replacing the commercial fertilizer that might uh, uh, normally be put down with this manure application, gaining more economic uh, value from the manure, and then balancing out the phosphorus so that we're not applying ex we're not applying an excess of phosphorus over the crop rotation. Uh, Glenn Arnold is a field specialist that works in that manure application area. He's been working on this for um, several years now, and we are uh, really getting some good results as far as economic results, uh, also applying less overall nutrients uh, with this project and uh, getting some uh, traction as far as adaptation of this uh, type of recommendation out in the field with farmers. Um, then we've got a couple of projects coming here that we're gearing up uh, to work with and these are targeted towards the Northwest Ohio area. Uh, we do have uh, several partners here on this project where we're going to be hiring four program coordinators to do nutrient management plan writing in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Uh, this is a necessary component for that uh, monies uh, that uh, Jay was talking about earlier with the RCPP. Um, most of those uh, programs are going to require a nutrient management plan be in place initially before accessing some of the other conservation programs. So uh, this will add to what is the commercial base as well as the uh, already existing uh, governmental base with ODNR and SWCDs to get these nutrient management plans written and get them so that uh, people can access the NRCS cost share programs. Um, Farm Bureau, Ohio Corn Growers, um, the Soybean 
uh, Council, the Ohio Small Grains Marketing Program, and Ohio State University are all partners in that particular activity. Uh, the second project here that's gearing up is a farm, farm advisor, water quality sampling network. Uh, what we're doing is uh, going to do some sampling at tile outlets, uh, looking at soluble phosphorus release. Uh, this is a two-year project funded by the Board of Regents, and uh, we're going to really target a fall and spring time frame when really most of the runoff or most of the um, nutrient flow and water flow flow through tile lines occurs and look at uh, what we're seeing as far as DRP release at that point in time. Uh, we can use this in, in comparing with our edge of field sites that are intensively 24 um, hour, 365 a day a uh, year sampling. Uh, we can use these results to complement that and get some ideals over more landscape uh, situations, what we're seeing as far as actual loss of nutrients and uh, what water quality concerns uh, exist with different management practices. And uh, brings me to really my last um, informational slide here and, and that ideal of really starting to understand field by field what activities and what type of uh, risk we see is really important when you look at some of the edge of field results that we've gathered. Um, you see here where we have a profile of uh, about uh, 12 to 15 different fields. Uh, they're paired fields, so A and A go together, B and B go together, but you can see that not all fields release at the same rate um, the nutrient uh, as far as DRP that we're seeing law um, in this graphic here. Um, this is broken out by tile and surface, and I think it was an important thing that Chris brought up earlier as far as tile versus surface. Um, right now, with this graphic, it looks like tile is a, is a huge contributor, and from um, the standpoint of the amount of water that flows through, we do see total loading increase. Uh, the thing that we need to think about also, though, is the concentration. Uh, the concentrations that come out the end of the tile line are a lot different in profile than what we see coming off of the surface um, and really by 10 times uh, less uh, coming off of the or coming out through the tile lines versus what's coming off of the surface. In other words, uh, with this project, our, our surface uh, concentrations are about 0.4 parts per million. Uh, coming through the tile line, 0 0.04 parts per million has been the average over this project. So uh, that, that's an important thing to, to note here. Uh, second thing is uh, that we want to uh, think about adaptation of best management practices. Obviously, there's a cost to those, and we really want to target best management practices to those fields where we have the highest contribution because there is an economic cost to implementing those. So uh, taking a look at these higher risk fields and, and putting those uh, best management practices in the right place is another characteristic that we want to do, particularly when that involves a cost share that's coming in, uh, which are public monies that help us uh, look at implementation of these. We want to be able to address that question of how much phosphorus are you reducing uh, when you spend these public dollars for cost share. So uh, a couple, three things that we're trying to address by better understanding our field-to-field -field impacts related to phosphorus release. And uh, this is my contact information. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you a few thoughts today, and please do not hesitate to contact uh, me if you have more questions about uh, this presentation that uh, we ran through pretty quickly here this morning. Thanks.